So yeah, as owner said, uh, to do it today will be a uh, restoration, and I'm gonna go over like materials that we've been over in the class. And if you have any question, uh, feel free to ask them. And I'm gonna have like some practice question for you guys uh, to do later. And I plan to have like some bonus points for you guys uh, for the homework, for the homework too. If you can answer some of these practice questions. <coughs> And here's the upcoming schedule uh, tonight by midnight. And we have some spare like slack time for you guys. So if you like have to submit say five minutes after midnight, say Comcast at your apartment says I to like went down and stuff like that. Should be okay. Uh, but the, the actual uh, deadline would be like midnight and a little bit after it. By Wednesday, homework two is due. Uh, pretty much the same drill as homework one, but be aware that it's a lot longer than homework one. 15 pages long. Uh, if you haven't looked at it yet, please take a look and think about the question a little bit so you have like, once you actually try to do the homework, it's like, oh, yeah, I think I saw this question like before when I, mean, I read it. And exam one would be like in one month. And right now, like, Today, we are about a quarter through for the whole class, like four weeks of 16 weeks. <coughs> and lab one feedback. Uh, I think most of the common errors would be all on the like, corner case of CPSR. We have a few people who had like bugs on the PC value. Say for example, some people forgot to add the PC value at the last, like really last cycle. So they, they lose points on that. Uh, it's like every PC value is correct until the last cycle and you, you do like SPY 10. Well, why does it matter what the PC is when you do SPY 10? Well, I mean, right before that, right, right before that instruction, like right before it actually exit the execution. But then well, the value isn't defined for that instruction because... No, no, I meant like the instruction before. Like at SPY 10. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Or not. And... Um, the most common would be like, we have some weird instructions and CPS are uh, different than our simulator. Uh, we are gonna release the setup test that you guys fail within each of your handling directory. So you can see the name of the test that we are testing and you guys fail on so that you know to be aware of that particular instruction for f uh, future labs. Uh, what happened? Uh, yeah, you can ask these guys. So when's the expected time that we're gonna parse the name of the test that these people fail on? Uh, I'm assuming by Monday it should be on. Okay, so it's not gonna be ready by lab two, <laughs> but hope that would help for lab three. We'll try to get it today, obviously. Okay, yeah, because I, as, I was assuming this, was, this hasn't been done before in the previous semester. So we are being a little bit more lenient on you guys because ARM has a lot of like corner cases that you can fail on, like all the condition codes and uh, the PC values comparing to MIPS. <coughs> and for the homework one, there are some common mistakes, like you guys just somehow count the bits wrong. Like, like you did everything correct, like every instruction looks fine, multiply numbers, and the number is of like nine multiplied by three becomes 24. And those are pretty common. I'm not sure why, but like, please be careful with that. I don't like take a little bit of points off because of that, but because it's incorrect, I have to like, like one, like one or two points off. Uh, on the data flow question, please, please make sure you have arrows. Don't just use lines because I don't know what produce value to what. And also, if say this particular bubble to take one or two inputs, don't put four or five inputs into one like bubble, because I, I had a few people doing that. Uh, if that's the case, let's have multiple bubbles to take in value and then it's propagate to the next uh, uh, bubble. I mean the next <coughs> stage in the data flow. And for the question on variable length encoding, uh, a lot of people use a fixed number of bits for the opcode, say, because we have eight instructions. 
you use three bits for each of the instructions. One, one positive optimization, and actually owner went over this a little bit in class on how Intel x86 done their uh, variable encoding, is to use a half encode, uh, encoding. Because once you know which instruction is more commonly used, you can use fewer bits. It's like when you are compressing the data, so that in the end, your code size is smaller than what it should have been. So, so one, one possible optimization is just uh, half an encoding for that. And now, any question, like last minute question on lab two before they're due, or like if you have any question on lab three. Yes? Um, no, that's why I put it back down. Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, any question is fine, really. I guess like for some of my control stuff, mm -hmm. I literally did it in like a small combinational block, which then gets represented in my diagram. It's just a block that has all the inputs and all the outputs. So would you guys take points off for that? Because I'm not going to do like... That should be okay. That should be fine. Yeah, that should be fine. I mean, because in, in, in theory and actually in practice, whatever goes into your core, as long as it's abided by the ISA, it's okay. Because the microarchitecture that goes inside the core will not, I mean, as long as it goes along with the ISA and you produce the correct output, that's okay. The trade-off would be like, if you have more complex design, you, you spend more area or you have like a longer critical path. So your design be say slower, for example. So it might affect later labs when you have extra credit on like how fast your, your core is performing comparing to other students. But yeah, it's, it's all up to you for like what goes into that. You can have like a wrapper modules that take uh, <coughs> uh, some particular wires and do some combinational logic on that to make things simpler for, for your uh, design. Any other questions? Yeah? Can you explain what you meant by people's PC being off before the last instruction? Are you saying that it was off after they executed this wire or immediately before this wire was executed? Uh, Xiao, can you help on that? So the PC is loaded into a, um, well, no, the, the halt is loaded into a register. So in other words, it's going to halt the cycle after it is done. So as long as you increment the PC correctly at the end of every step, you should see the correct result. Well, right, but when when you have a SWI 10, because you're halting, the like, PC doesn't matter anymore. So um, whether or not the register it, is well. down, it's going to matter. So when we're grading. Well, yeah, but it should be undefined. I mean, well, technically, you should move forward, right? Because the, the spec cool. says that PC should always go to the increment next one. Or suppose if the swipe was actually a um, null. For example, <coughs> you put swipe <laughs> 9 instead of swipe 10, right? You will move on forward instead of trapping. So that would be the expected behavior. But I mean, the default value for a swipe is to go to, like, what, 0x8? So right. where does it say, for like, at least for lab 1, where did it say that we had to increment the swipe we had to increment the PC after a SWI, because that, that particular part of SWI is completely undefined, except for what we're being told to do. Mm. Well, uh, I think uh, we define in the first lab handout uh, what to do in SWI specifically. So we call it SWI just because it's a system instruction as such, but it's not SWI as per ARM specification. I think we made that clear in the first lab handout. Yeah. yeah. All right. So it's not an ARM specification SWI. It's your specification SWI, and your specification does not define what PC should be after that. Uh, I think we just define it as increment. We define it should be. Yeah, I think we, we define it to be increment by four. It makes sense that it should be that, but you didn't define it. Like I don't think the last one actually says it. It, it does. Fine. Yeah. It does. All right. Uh, any other question from lab one and lab two? That's correct. Okay. Yep. For synthesis, once you run it through design compiler, as long as you don't get any like inferred latches, mm -hmm. it's okay because I, I got a bunch of like, so my design works, but I got a bunch <coughs> of signals that say that at some point some net doesn't drive some other net. <coughs> and I'm wondering if that's because later it's optimized or something. That, that should be okay, yeah. So because that's okay most likely the case. Affairs. Right. So it's okay. <coughs> So yeah. if the synthesis completes, does that mean it's okay? 
if the system yeah. is complete with all without errors. errors. Warnings are right. Warnings are okay, but if you have, you have errors after synthesis, that you should look at the errors and see what's happening there. I don't. Mm, I don't think so. For this lab, we didn't specify. For next lab, it will be more important. Yeah. But it is very hard to get a design working correctly with inferred lashes because normally so, it's, it's yeah. doing something you are not meant to be doing. So so check check your results like carefully because that that might that might be something wrong or like weird numbers afterward uh, when you have those warnings. So be be careful with that. Also, that's one issue with the design compiler about uh, they, them crashing uh, in a non domestic way. And also, somebody posted on, on PSI, and we actually experienced that with our Golden Simulator, too. So just try. We are trying to figure out what's happening to the design compiler. It might be from, yes. So someone posted on Piazza today mm -hmm. that you can actually change the design compiler to be less efficient in terms of area, right. but it gets rid of the errors. So okay. Have the same error, just go ahead and change your design compiler to that setting. Yeah. Also, mine crashed, like I ran it, and then when I ran it again, it crashed. But I don't know if this was related or completely unrelated, but I just deleted all the files that it generated. Okay. So, what was the error that you got from the, the, the file? It just crashed. Okay. Yeah. I, I, did you run it on the AC machines? Yes. Because some, sometimes there'll be like some random user use a machine and they have like memory leaks. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, that might happen or like changing a machine might help a little bit. Yes? So I have the same non deterministic error in 341. Uh huh. Uh, I think it's just something that designs uh, the scratches randomly. Mm -hmm. um, well, for terms of grading, as long as will you rerun the grading script? If yes, it yes. So if it crashes, you make sure it's not your. If it's not your pr like from your problem or like your 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 hand in, you will make sure it's correct. So it's like the way it crashes, <coughs> it's just like it encountered a fatal error, and now ending or something. Like that. Yeah. Whereas if you have an error, it usually says error and then it points to it. Right. So one of the easiest way of doing is um, while you're check before you check off, make sure you have like a a word <coughs> recorded. Yeah. So when you're checking, we can just look it from a log or something like that. Right. Because we, when we check you guys off, it's like, well, you get it compiled, that should be okay. And if it crashes while we are testing, we're just going to re rerun the test and make sure that we know what exactly is happening. Oh, and make, make sure you don't edit the Mac files and we'll any of the... A new version with the suggested changes. Yeah. Because there was uh, one of the Hanlon uh, for lab one. The we we try to use the make files that we provided to you and it crashes. So we have to spend like a little bit of time trying to figure out what's happening. Alright, any other question for lab one and lab two and homework one, and also homework two? Yes, correct. Um, just that's an announcement. Please make sure you submit in the format that we request in the hand in the oh lab yes, handout, because otherwise it's very hard to create without that same format. Say, for example, you, you put in like the folder lab one slash something, or like your Android ID, your Android ID again, lab one slash something, or something along that line. So, yeah. Make sure it's the same format as what we specify in the handout. Any other announcement? One last thing, we're checking out, make sure to bring a um, printout of your. Um, of the diagram. Of the diagram. Yeah. That would help a lot. <coughs> yes? So the checkoffs are next week, right? Yeah, starting next week. Yep. What if, like, the diagram is pretty big? Can we just show you the PDF? Because that's how I submitted it. It's like yeah, we, we, you can use the PDF and use the monitor in the lab. That also works. Okay. Yeah. I do want a physical diagram, though. But it's going to be a beetle. It's going to be small. No, if you can do, like, a couple of A4 pages together, if that's possible. Oh, okay. Okay. You can stick it together, that's fine. Don't, don't do the positive print though, that, that, those things are expensive. <laughs> well, no, but I mean, like, there, there's a function. Oh, that, can, that, like, yeah. Print where you can tell it post or print, <coughs> and it will like you stitch tell it. How many pages you right, want right. To span. Okay. Okay, sure.
I mean, if you really love your design, you could print a poster for it. <laughs> So, if you have any questions about lab one, lab two, homework one, homework two, we can you can ask me later, maybe during the break or after class or office hour. Uh, also, lab three because they were released two days ago. Yeah, Wednesday night, and they'll that'll be on pipelining. So you spend a lot of time implementing pipelining for ARM architecture, and right now so. These are the important topics that we've covered so far. Uh, I say single cycle micro architecture, multi cycle micro architecture, micro program, pipelining, and branch prediction. Uh, and I assure, like, make, make sure you know all these six topics well because they will be on exam. And now it's a question and answer. If you have any question related to any of the topics uh, that you want me to describe more in detail, uh, for example, if owner went over any particular topic too fast, yes? I guess what's the difference between like <coughs> micro-coded design and like a multi-cycle, like a, a pipeline where you're doing, I guess, I guess, I understand that in a pipeline you're doing multiple things at the same time. But other than that, that you're just like breaking up the actual instruction execution into multiple cycles. Okay, so uh, for the microcoded design, you you still see the design as like a single cycle in, in, instruction. From which perspective? From the uh, programmer perspective, uh, perspective. Also okay. the designer. So you you. For the say pipelining, when you advance an instruction, you increase the PC. You sh you fetch the new instructions. Yeah, I guess I'm saying uh, apart from f doing multiple instructions at the same time through the pipeline. Yes. So for the microcoded, for example, you stop fetching the new instruction. Yeah. So you halt, kind of halt the. Suppose you. So one of, one other example is to do the load load store multiple instruction in ARM, yeah. where you load multiple things within one instructions. So that one, one way you can do this, which is you, what you can do in the extra credit, is to use microprogram in your, pipe, uh, in your design. And say you are doing pipelining on ARM, so you, you fetch, uh, every cycle you fetch an instruction. But then once you see this multiple load and store, yeah. you do not fetch. You just uh, halt the PC yeah. and kind of stall the pipeline. And you enable this unit where it start doing mi mi uh, micro program, multi uh, micro code design, where you start uh, looping around this particular instruction, yeah. load, keep keep loading until you uh, are done with that particular instruction, and then you re enable the actual ARM design pipeline and continue with uh, the the stream of instructions again. Okay, so essentially, like uh, the difference is that. Um Microcode design is the worst case pipeline where you're halting at each instruction and you don't fetch until the instruction is completely executed. I, I would say it's, don't call that the worst case. It's, it's a trade off where you, you have this uh, specialized design that you can put in your a core or within the ISA to make some particular instruction more efficient. But it would cost you area and it would cost like internally, some extra, there'll be some extra cost associated with it. But you're not running at a different clock rate. So you're not you're running at a different clock rate. Just be the pipeline yes. Done. Yes. Okay. But with that in mind, you don't have to do, say, you, you start the pipeline, you don't have to do, like, try to fill in the instruction, for example, or like fill in the pipeline. Everything is yeah. already filled. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. Sort of the same question, I think, but. Actually. <laughs> So your question, I want to repeat this for the recording. Uh, so your question is, uh, mu is micro multi-program design or wait, wait. By micro design necessarily multi-cycle? Is micro program design necessarily multi-cycle? Uh, usually, yes. 
I don't I don't think there's any when I don't feel like there's a point of doing micro program design with one cycle versus you can execute that within a single cycle anyway. Right? But I mean if you want to implement it, you can probably implement that design. But what would be the benefit? Probably not. Yes? Well like from the ISA perspective, it's yes. multi cycle, but from the micro architecture perspective it's single cycle. So like each micro instruction takes one cycle. No, but his his question is like what if you have a micro program design that takes one cycle? Which is pretty much I would say meaningless because you don't have to do that. I mean, why, why would you design something like that? You just have like, you would just call it a, a, a single cycle, like say, design anyway. So, yes? So for microcode, it says the control signal is going to determine the next state. Yes. Uh, so your question is, can you explain why would it, why would a control signal uh, Okay, so how, how this microprogram is done? Uh, how next cycle is determined in the microprogram. Okay, how next cycle. So, suppose you, so first thing first, you do still uh, advance the clock. So, clock still is still ticking. So, let, let me use the uh, multiple load and store as, one, as an example. You don't fetch the next instruction, so that, that the pipeline is halted, but then because the clock is ticking, you have another control signal that control this particular load and store uh, that keep advancing from stage one to stage two to stage three. For example, let me let me draw a diagram. Let's do this. Wait. Interesting. No, but I. Mm, is there a look? Oh, okay. <coughs> so suppose you want to do a multiple load and store for, for the multiple load so instruction in ARM. Uh, and your microprogram design, you can think of it as like a table of states that you cycle through. So the first entry, uh, the first column would be the state. And whatever goes in here will be just the index so that you can uh, loop through in your FSM. And then you have the data part that is capable of actually doing a single load and single store, right? But and each of each one of these data parts are being controlled by some signals. So say for example for state zero, this is the initialization state where you see where you decode this particular load. So the control signal <coughs> would be first uh, like halt the PC. So you assert a signal to halt the PC. And then you assert another signal to advance this uh, state internally. Which pretty much just say, uh, whatever the state is from this state, jump to this, the, the second state, which is 001. And in this, uh, the next uh, state, what would you do? Uh, the first thing you would do is you try to load one, uh, the data to some location in, uh, from, from, get the data from some location in the memory and load the data to, a, a, say, a register. So in here you perform one load. And what you would assert in the control signal is uh, whatever you have to assert for a, uh, a single cycle load instruction, that 
connects to the, mem uh, the main memory so that you can load one particular uh, memory address into the register. So this you would, you would, what would you do here to assert a load instruction in the memory? <coughs> and then you would, the next thing you would do is to uh, go to the next state. Uh, so for this case, what, we w what you would want to do is to check whether you're done loading or not. If it's not done, you cycle through the same state and load the next instruction, uh, move the index f that point to the particular location in the memory uh, to the next location so, so you can load the next entry and say, suppose the next state will be the done state, which is the third one. What, you, what would you do here is to uh, unhalt the PC and then disable this state and go back, uh, make, make sure whatever goes into here, go back to state zero. And then you're done. Once you unhold the PC, if you see advanced, it fetch the next instructions. You finish performing all these multiple loads instruction for the ARM, for that one single ARM uh, load, multiple load store instructions. So this is one way you can do the microprogram, uh, microcoded instructions within uh, single cycle design. Any other questions? If you have any other questions, feel free to ask like any time during th this lecture. And what I'm going to do next is I'm going to uh, split you guys into multiple groups of five and work on uh, some sample problems. Some of them come from previous exams, some of them from, from previous homeworks. And this should be really beneficial for you guys so that you can study on the exam and you know like what particular topics that you might want to study more or that you already forgot about like previous early, early lecture, say pipelining or data dependencies. Uh, so yeah, uh, why, want, why don't you guys just like group into like a group of five right now? And any question, so there'll be a, a bunch of questions I'm, I'm gonna ask uh, af like after this slide. Any question that each of the group get it right, I'll give like extra 1% on homework too as uh, extra credit. So the whole group will get them. But it's not a competition. Oh, so the first, the first group to answer. So <laughs> try to beat the time a little bit. Otherwise, the, the, the grade will blow it to some degree. Because anyone can just like follow what the first group answer. And then you either, get, you either all get that extra credit or not getting that extra credit. Yes, but then only the people who are here that, also, that is also true, but I mean, <laughs> that, that holds true even if it's like speed runs. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> exactly. Okay, yeah, so let, let's do that right now. Uh, process this information first while I'm getting the equation ready. All right, and consider these two programs. Is this okay? Call you off if there are errors. All right, so feel free to correct me and take the points. Um, so for machine Y and program B, we're told that it's a load store machine. So that means that we're going to be operating on registers. And before we can do that, we have to put the data into the registers, right? So if we take a look at the program, it's B equals B plus A, right? So first we have to load B and A, which means we do some sort of load instruction, some sort of load instruction, right, to get B into A, right? 
sorry, to get the actual value of a into a. We also have to load b, right? So we have another load instruction here so that we have both values. Then we can actually compute b plus a, right, and store that into some register b, correct? So yeah, sorry. So then we actually do the addition. And this computes the value of b. And now we should probably store b because we just got it. So we're going to go ahead and store that. The next instruction is b plus a. We already have this newly computed b um, because we just calculated it and put it in some instruction. And we already have a because we fetched it. So we're going to do the addition to figure out what c is. And now that we have C, we're going to take this C and store it. I'm assuming here that every time we calculate a new value, we're putting it into some sort of register that we can use later. Now we do A minus C. Again, we already have A, and we already have C. So we do some sort of subtract instruction here. And this gives us D. Having D, we can take D and store it into memory. Um, and then. The final instruction is d minus c. We already have d and we already have c, right? And this is supposed to be a equals d minus c. So we do this instruction, which again is a sub. And finally, we store it back into a's address, which should be an str. So are we OK with this? All right, cool. No contestants. Now we have to look at the size. Um, data and instruction size are both 4. So what we first do is just count the number of instructions, because those have to be fetched from memory. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Um, and 10 times 4. So that's 40 bytes for instructions. But we also have the data instructions that transfer 4 bytes each. So we look at the data instructions. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 6 times 4 is 24. And we add these, and we get 64 bytes. So what program was this? OK. Yes. Just stand right next to me and hold the thing. Hold it? OK. All right. So I'm going to erase this here. This was, wait, no, leave it. Okay. This was YV. I'm going to do. Um, XB. OK, so for XB, um, it's really easy because all of the instructions in program B are memory addresses, and machine X just operates on memory. So pretty much every instruction looks about the same because you store into a memory location, and then you have two other memory locations that you operate on. And since each instruction is dependent on the previous instruction, you can't like reorder them in any way. So what I got was pretty much uh, just an add um, into B. So we can take the, the three address mode and do like a BBA, and then uh, add uh, CBA. Because we, we don't have any registers. We can't reuse any of these values. We have to reload them every time. And then you can do a sub uh, into D of a minus c, and then you do a sub into a of d minus c. And each of these memory locations uh, is going to be four bytes, because you know that's the data transferred. And then each of the instructions in this one is seven bytes. So the total I got was 76 for the four instructions is 28, and all of those memory locations is 48. Thanks, bro. I pressed the button. It might not work. Oh, here's the thing. Do I just speak to this? Flip it to your shirt. This is good? Okay, uh, add x a, um, so for machine x, um, a line of code would just be op 
M M I I. Right. So I is useless here. Um, so each instruction is just um, one load and one store. So four plus four, eight bytes for memory. Um, and each line of code is four bytes. So no, seven bytes. So. So memory for each line of instruction is 15 bytes. And basically, every line of code is the same. So times 4, 60 bytes for XA. So I did a uh, machine Y program A, and for that, each one of the lines is pretty much the same. It's just a load uh, from memory value A, B, C, or D, and then you do the operation, which is an add or subtract, and then you store it back up to the uh, memory address, and you're doing this four times. So that's 12 instructions, which is four bytes each, and eight memory operations, which are also four bytes each, so that's 80. All right, cool. Any other groups want to like challenge this? But I think it's pretty much correct. Okay, cool. Uh, So what's the group number? One, yes. So I can keep track of how many points people got. Yeah. And I'll like get your Andrew ID afterward. <coughs> okay, so yeah, that's how that actually that's why a lot of industries switch to multi-core. You just like have four people work on different questions. Yeah, that's a bad joke. Sorry. My bad. I'm dumb as <laughs> Fine. Noter does it all the time. You know, we're talking about like we'll be in a meeting or something and somebody will say something about, oh well I can work on this and you can work on that. Oh, Alright, like, oh, here's the <laughs> next question. The the question is simply what does this thing do? You probably will need some room here. Uh, you, right. can, you can say the actor first, in case it's wrong. And All right. Add a group. Uh, okay. Well, it's going to determine if there's an even or an odd number of ones in x. That's a really fast answer, but yeah, it's correct. Yes. <laughs> uh, can uh, you show how you got that answer? Right. So uh, if you look at this portion of it, um, well, uh, whenever you're doing a subtract one and 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 then looping around, like that almost always uh, means that you're doing a pop count. Uh, so, like, I know that there's a some type of like you're basically iterating, and for every one that you have in your initial value, it's going to iterate again. Uh, and then uh, this is just going to keep looping. Uh, switching between uh, true and false uh, until the output happens. So, yeah. I, I don't know how much like detail to go into. Like. Okay. <laughs> I think it's that's enough. Yeah. Cool. All right. 
and I guess in case people are looking at previous exam, previous homework, can you guys close the laptop? Do you mind? <laughs> That group called them off if they start opening things like that uh, that looks like an exam or like PDF files. <laughs> yeah. All right. <clears throat> this will be a question on pipelining. Uh, so for what are the three? Well, by the way, what's your group number? Two. Two. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I can make up that too, actually. All right. I saw hands over there. Did you guys? So there's the data dependencies. Yeah. And the control flow dependencies. Mm -hmm. um. <laughs> 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 it's like, oh, you're right. <laughs> it starts out empty. <laughs> 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 I guess that can be the third reason, but like that's another reason. That's control dependence. Uh, yes, I mean you you can call that resource contention. Yeah, so you get two third, you get one third of that. Yes. All right, and what are the cause of all these three dependencies? Like, give give me an example, like a course snippet of here. Yes. You you can take that too. All right. <laughs> That's not going to work very well. Okay. So read, so read after write first. I like it. You're on my save way like Read after write would imply that you have like an R1 and you're loading it with, I don't know, R2 plus R3. <laughs> and then you're doing something to R4 involving R1. So this is. So you have to this is reading. To this is reading from R1 after you've written to R1. That's the read after write dependency. And then what's the next one? Write, write after write. So write after write doesn't matter as much. It's just if you write to R1 and then you write to R1 again. Um, nobody really cares, and that's cool. And then right after read is you read from R1 or whatever R you're doing. And then you write to it. Again, nobody really cares. <laughs> Well, actually, that's not true. Uh, okay, uh, yeah. So it like depends because like because you are sharing the reference, it depends. So you have to make sure that you're, for example. Okay, so what he said was this is the only real. The reason that he said it doesn't really matter is because this is the only real one because it's kind of data flow. You're passing data through this. Whereas the other ones are only a limitation of how many registers you have and where you don't have like a gazillion, you could just continually assign new registers. But these ones you have to be aware of, for example, because let's say you look at, um, what is this, right after read, if you're doing some sort of data reordering or re reordering the instructions in real time, you have to make sure, for example, that this has been read before you override the value. Yes. So yeah. Like. For example, if you have like a branch data slot and you move one instruction ahead of that time, so now they are not become uh, 
it's possible that they're not running in the sequential order anymore. You have to be careful about these uh, two dependencies. And later on in, our, in, in the class, we're going to cover what we call uh, our order execution, which means uh, <coughs> we are not going to execute instruction in the sequential order anymore. Because sometimes when you do that, uh, you can sometimes uh, start the pipeline. But if you can reorder this instruction and then let some other later instructions where the data already arrived in the data flow order executed first, uh, you can run into some of these uh, dependencies issue. And we'll go over how to make sure uh, we don't have these dependencies issues. <coughs> Right, and give me three ways to eliminate flow dependencies. Yes. Data forwarding. Yes. Uh, bubbling, like style bubbling. Yes. And you went through about like five techniques actually. Um, do something else. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's too universal. Like, can you like okay. elaborate? Yes. <laughs> yes, you can do things out of order. Yeah, actually, go go ahead. Like finish out all the other the techniques. Oh. What? Okay, what, what you said is true. That's the dependence still there. So you have to store that particular instruction until either that or you can do the data forwarding where you forward the data. The dependence is still there, but you can execute that particular instruction. Well, yeah, but if you're doing super scalar, then that doesn't yes. necessarily work. Uh, yes, yeah. Yes, that also works. Right? Cool. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> And you guys do, yes. Okay. <laughs> and pick a number. Okay, pick a number. <laughs> I don't think that added up to one. Oh, okay. So, yeah, I think we're four. Isn't... Oh, you guys are guys four, okay. <laughs> Alright. <coughs> and this will be a problem about uh, branch prediction. Look at this uh, code snippet and I'll uh, write out the, the problem that I want you guys to answer. <coughs> In particular, look at the outer loop and the inner uh, branches. All right, so uh, the loop branch is going to be taken every time. Um, this is only taken a quarter of the time, and since this always comes after a loop branch, which is always taken, then this will be predicted uh, correctly 25% of the time. Uh, this one is taken uh, half the time, but it's like it, it'll have the same branch as this one 75% of the time. And by that I mean, if this one's taken, then this one will be taken. Uh, if this one's not taken, in two of the cases where i is one or three, then this will also not be taken, so this will be still correct. The only time that this will be mispredicted is if uh, i is two, or it, i mod four is two, uh, in which case this will not be taken and this will be taken. So this will be 75% of the time. Uh, and then the loop, um, which comes after this branch. Uh, this is taken every other time, uh, and the loop is taken every time, so 50% of the time uh, the loop will be correct. So that's 50%, 75%, 25% uh, for the three different uh, types of branches here. Uh, so the, uh, and each of them happens a thousand times. Uh, so you can just average them and say that the branches will be predicted correctly 50% of the time for A. Uh, 
first breath. Well, yeah, minus the first. But since it's a thousand, it would be off by max like 0.1 percent. So I'm I'm happy with that prediction. <laughs> And do you guys have an answer for two? <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. So, uh, if we start off with taken, taken. Taken, not, not, taken, not, taken, taken, not, not, taken. This is the repeating 12 branch pattern for four loops, I think. Yeah. And so if we assume this one starts thinking that it's going to be weakly not taken, then this one is incorrect but then it's weakly taken, so this one's correct. Then it's strongly taken. So then both of these fail because it comes weakly taken, or weakly taken. This one's strongly taken, this one's weakly taken. And then this one is weakly not taken, which means this one also fails. Then another weakly taken, so this one fails. Another weakly not taken, so this one fails. And then here we have a weakly taken, so that succeeds. So this is now strongly taken, so both of these fail. And it's now strongly not taken, so this one fails. And we're back to uh, weakly taken being, or weakly not taken being correct here. So this pattern will keep repeating, which is, oh crap, that's only three out of 12. That's different from what I had. Mm. This one is, Weakly taken, strongly. Okay, well, I'm going to go with this answer, which is 25%, I think. Okay, roughly, yeah. Roughly. In, because mean, the... In the actual exam, don't forget when you enter the loop... Yes, uh, so entering the loop the first time, this will be a 1, so that's an extra 1 out of 1,000. Yeah. Um, the final loop will be not taken, which will be another correct, which is an extra 2 out of 1,000. So it's 25 point... Two percent, or yeah, it's close, but it's around one fourth. <coughs> Something along that line, but yes. Uh, in the exam, ma make sure you take into account of when you enter the loop and when you exit the loop and get the correct answer. Or if you want to approximate, say you approximate it because that's this uh, time when you enter the loop and how many times. Uh, in extra, that would be correct or incorrect. Can you give us an idea of what's the point, like, result would be if we forgot to handle that case? Uh, that would have to depend on the rubric, but I want, I want, I'm, I'm not going to say it's going to be a lot. I hope. <laughs> Yes. Um, if we go back into the loop, is that counted as taken or not? It's counted as taken. Okay. Yep. <coughs> and like during the exam, if you have any like <coughs> questions like that, like does it count as te uh, taken when you loop back? Just raise your hand and ask if it's unclear. I mean, it should always be taken, shouldn't it? It is. Unless you have like two branches in your for loop doing something. Yes. I'm I'm just saying like oh if you're unclear about things like that which is more minor details if you do out we're gonna answer it for you guys. Right? And using the same code but what if we use a two, uh, global and local predictor? This is a uh, a saturating uh, branch predictor, except it's like having three independent branch predictors for each of the branches. So we can think about them independently. Uh, for the for loop, since it's taken every time, it'll always be strongly taken, except for the first two times, so that's 99.8% accuracy. 
Uh, well, the first and the last time, so that's <coughs> twice that it would fail, 99.8%. Um, this one will always be either strongly or weakly not taken, uh, which means that it will be mispredicted 25% of the, or it'll be, yeah, it'll be mispredicted 25% of the time or predicted correctly 75% of the time. And then this one, uh, depending on how you enter the situation, uh, I'll assume that you're starting out with no knowledge, uh, in which case it'll jump back and forth between uh, weekly taken and not taken. Uh, in which case it will always be incorrect, uh, but we don't necessarily know that that's the case because if the predictor had been trained previously, uh, in a worst case scenario, it could have been, uh, or in a best case scenario, it could have been strongly taken, uh, in which case then uh, on the first iteration, it's taken again, it's still strongly taken, and it would go back and forth between strongly and weakly taken, and it would be correct 50% of the time. Um, but the worst case is that it would be uh, uh, predicted 0% of the time. So 0%, 99.8%, and 75%. Uh, so on average, that's uh, 7 twelfths <laughs> minus a little bit. Yeah. Uh, no, yeah. Okay, because what I was going to say is you don't actually have to, because the, so you know the actual pattern that this executes in, right? And yes. This is a repeated pattern. Yes. And that's what's, the actual thing that you do is what gets shifted into the global table. So knowing yes. that pattern, you can actually figure that, figure out whether they're, they fall into different buckets or they have an interference pattern, which you would have to do first, right? But that, that's given you know the pattern. No, but like in general, when you design a branch predictor, because you don't always know the pattern, you, you pretty much try to guess for the common cases. But I thought that it was, you have this kind of register that you shifted what you're actually doing, and you yeah. use that register to map to a table that has the local. Right? Yeah. I'm saying that the assumption that they're all in different buckets mm -hmm. can be verified because you know what pattern this code runs in. That is true, yes, yes, yes. Okay. I thought you meant like in general, if you don't know the code. Oh, no, 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 I was just making sure because like in okay. the test we wouldn't be able to assume we would have to figure that out. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. To figure out whether they, mm -hmm. they have interference Yeah, there, there's no, you, you, you can assume there's no interference between buckets. Otherwise, oh, you, can. you, 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 you can assume. Oh, if you have questions, just ask in the exam. Okay. Yeah. Because yeah. if, if, if we don't specify anything in the exam, pretty much you can assume that there's no interference between but this, but different buckets. That, that, this, that can be. This code. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Alright. <coughs> Alright, and the last question will be on the uh, branch delay slot. Um, this actually, this one should be pretty easy. Uh, supposing have five stage pipeline, fetch, decode, memory, uh, execute, memory access, and write back. How many delay slots you would need? Yes. Five. Why? Because you use the first delay slot for each slot in your pipeline, such that. No, but it's it's a branch delay slot. Yes. Alright, uh, how many? Yes, which is um, number. Yes. And next, so there are two questions. Yeah. So, and what's the number of delay slots? Okay, that's the question, my bad. I have another question here. Uh, what what if you can modify anything anything in the pipeline? Uh, what what can you do to reduce this number? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I think you kind of like. You you raise your hand before I like hit. <laughs> I mean, it's just the same thing. You're just trying to move it earlier. Right. Exactly. So yeah. Can resolve whatever you can in the earlier stage and then reduce that. 
I'll just like split into half for you guys. Yeah. But you can you can resolve it earlier by moving this particular computation in the decode state. So that the delay slot become one and it's easier to shift anything afterward into that delay slot. But that always assumes that any dependencies that you have are you have to, in yes. advance. So if you have a dependency that needs to be <coughs> executed and you're trying and that's coming right before the branch, right. then Really right. Anything. So anything that fails into that delay slot, you have to make sure all the dep dependencies is still intact and not you don't run like via sequential orders. Yes, you got a one point two. Right. Uh, actually, that's that's all the practice question I have. And actually, those are questions that come from either the exam or the homework, as I said. So you can expect that similarity in the exam question with a lot more number of questions. Uh, that's all I have. Anyone else have any questions about like the materials we we uh, have been over in the past four weeks? These are these are the topics. Yeah. I guess this is more of a personal question, but from your experience, how much does he actually bring in from the papers into the exam? Do how much do I did I bring I in? You guys have taken the course. Yeah, I I, I, I didn't take this class with owner, so maybe uh, Pra should have a better answer. Um, I would think uh, I would say it's very important to understand the papers, because. Uh, wh uh, while he wouldn't be like, okay, in this paper, what did he mean by this technique or something? But um, his questions focus more on applications. And a lot of times you may need the understanding from the paper to actually do the questions completely. <coughs> and have you, I have a quick question about that. Like, would it be useful if I kind of, kind of dis to all the papers that you've been over so far and like cover that in one of the lab section. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'll 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 manage uh, that maybe in the next, not next week, but like next two week, and I'll I'll, I'll cover for you guys for for that week, and I'll, I'll like present the papers that owner has been uh, putting in the required reading sections, uh, so that is, and that should be about right before the midterm exam too. That should helps a lot. Okay. Also. Uh, I realized that somehow owner mentioned were like different machines that use different particular techniques. I'm gonna distill that and uh, kind of make it easier for you guys to like say understand what does each machine do. Uh, so I guess I'll mark my calendar on that. Right? Uh, any other questions? <coughs>